The rule, the rule on the ground at Green College is that we wait until five after five because people have to find their way to the college from across campus. But I think we'll, I will say a few words now and um, by five after five, we'll really be set to go. Uh, good evening, everybody, or good whatever time of day it may be where you are. My name is Mark Vesey. I'm the principal of Green College. Um, and this is a great occasion for us here at the college. We have been waiting a while to, to welcome formally our 18th writer in residence, who is also, and this is part of the excitement and suspense, the first uh, ever Meredith and Peter Quatermain poet in residence at Green College. And I'm delighted to say that Meredith and Peter are here this evening in the room with us via Zoom. Uh, there they are, waving, you can see them. Um, they have been extremely generous to the college in gifting us with an endowment to support writers in residence from now on, who just happen to be really terrific poets. Um, and by really terrific, Peter and Meredith, I think both understand just pushing things a little further than might otherwise come naturally to language or to anyone in language. Um, and by that standard, seems to me, uh, we've absolutely nailed it with the inaugural Quartermain poet in residence. I am speaking as usual from some, somewhere around Green College, actually the principal's residence, which is part of the main um, ensemble of buildings here, which means I'm speaking once again from uh, the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people, uh, which those of us who live and work and play here occupy rent free, not because we've earned it, but because we've had this extraordinary good luck, uh, which is I suppose in some way commensurate with the misfortunes um, of other populations. And uh, we are very sensitive to that discrepancy. Long before there were poets and fiction makers in the traditions that, well, what shall I say, Peter, Peter Quatermain and I were trained up in to be university professors of English literature uh, or any other European literature uh, were to be found performing or reciting in these parts. Musqueam poets and fiction makers were busy about their language work and culture work. And that's the tradition and in a sense that we are, ah, looking to place ourselves in a significant relation to at this point, whatever that means in space, time and place. And those are some of the themes I suspect that we're going to be learning more about during Margaret's residency. I am not going to attempt to give an introduction really to Margaret Christakos. We don't stand much on CVs and bibliographies at Green College anyway. And to give any sort of an account uh, of a poet and language worker and professional such as she is would be quite beyond me. That's, of course, why uh, we have invited her to give, well, a reading and then some, I think was our understanding, wasn't it, Margaret? Um, under the title of Plough and Flow, Words Close Together in Space, Place, to launch a residency that will modulate, we're all hoping very much, into an in place in this space uh, performance in January. Margaret, welcome to Green College. Th 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 thank you for coming our way. <laughs> and um, could I leave it to you now to get this whole splendid Quartermain Poet in Residence business up and flying off wildly in all directions? I can try. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Uh, we've already had some interesting, you know, communication back and forth over this last six months as we sort of didn't know if the fall was going to go ahead. And I just want to thank you for making, um, you know, so much space to be flexible in terms of moving the, the residency to second term. Um, who knows? I think we're juggling together and it's, it's, it's really a delight for me. Um, I'm also thrilled to be the inaugural Meredith and Peter Quartermain 
poet in residence. I love Meredith and Peter's work, and I've had the pleasure to know them at times in, in Vancouver and, and in the writing community. And um, I also had the pleasure of being published by Nomados Press, their beautiful chapbook press uh, with this spicy little number, adult video, all the way back in 2006. Um, so I'm, I'm, I just wanna start by saying how, um, how touched I am to have a residency during the pandemic. Um, There's so few residencies across the country for writers of any genre. It seems there are fewer and fewer, and they really are, um, in my experience, just a you know an incredible jumping pad for creative work. Um, and I I'm thrilled to be able to to focus on my work and to interact with students as a writer in residence as opposed to a sessional lecturer. Um, there's a very different you know flavor and tenor to interacting with the community of. Uh, students and emerging writers. And I'm so thrilled about what we're gonna to do together. I would like to make an acknowledgement as well, but um, I do it with a poem. I do it with a poem that um, where I try to situate myself um, in this long process of acknowledgement and uh, de decolonization, which for me is, is intensely about learning and um, well, for all of us. There's a rain when you come in here. I am listening within those missing multitudes, those dismissing attitudes, those gestures tilting into listening toward more multitudinous noticings and assessing, not just wishing. I am learning listening in process into missingness for a future undismissing who is missing. I am listening within colonial history for who my peoples tried to make go missing. I am listening deeper into missingness, undismissing all those missing, missing and murdered, missing and murdered voices, indigenous voices, women's voices, queer and trans voices, rising sisters. Sing, miss, sing, miss, sing, miss, miss, sing, miss, sing, miss, sing, miss, sing, miss, miss, sing, miss. Did you notice? There's a rain in here. I am listening within those missing multitudes, those dismissing attitudes, those gestures tilting into listening toward more multitudinous noticings and assessing, not just wishing. I am learning listening in process into missingness for a future undismissing who is missing. I am listening within a more inclusive present to all those who survive going missing. I am listening deeper into missingness, undismissing all those missing, missing and murdered, missing and murdered voices, indigenous voices, children's voices, women's voices, queer and trans voices, rising sisters. Sing miss, sing miss, sing miss, miss, sing miss. Sing miss, sing miss, sing miss, miss, sing miss. Sing miss, sing miss, sing miss, miss, sing miss. Did we notice there's a huge rain when you come in here? It's wonderful to see you all, all those names, little boxes. Thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna to start tonight um, after what I've already offered, but uh, tonight, I just want to let you know sort of the structure of what I'm doing. Um, I've, I've actually written a talk. You know, it's on paper. It's something I deliver. Um, and it may seem a little formal, but I, I wanted to share it with you. So I'll be giving a talk. And then um, in, in the second part, um, I'll, I'll be sort of um, moving more towards discussing some of my own projects and um, sharing a few of my own works with you. But I am, just to be contrary, going to start with a poem from Multitudes, which is a book that uh, doesn't seem to be right here, was meant to be right here. Isn't that funny? It's gone missing. It's missing, miss. I'll have to find it later, oh my God. 
Okay, I won't start with, with threshold, but we've already started. So we'll just move directly to plow and flow. Two words so close in look and sound, they seem to swerve around and into each other, making it hard to read, for me anyway, to pronounce them reliably. Plow and flow, flow and plow, no, plow and flow. It's a bit of work to hold their tethers and I can get caught in confusion. That's okay, I often say. Margaret Christakos is a worker in the field of letters. I'm referring to the open field poetics of experimental language writing and the Canadian long poem, which surrounded me as a young writer in the 1980s, mentored by B.P. Nickel and Eli Mandel, then through the influence of writing by Daphne Marlatt, Fred Waugh, Betsy Warland, Roy Meeky, Aaron Murray, Lola Tostevin, Nicole Brassard, and Nurbezi Philip, all of whom worked and still work alongside with language, poetry, narrative in experimental ways. Here within the flowing space of field within which electric and language events are always happening, and by associating the plowing place of poetry with embodied labor that requires cycles of return and care, I'm thinking about poetry as a life practice, irrigated and suffused with attention, presence, and ongoingness. Some etymologists think that the word verse, as in poetic verse, which flows from the Latin versus, a line, row, line of verse, line of writing, and connotes to turn, to bend, also contains the agrarian metaphor of the plow, that writing verse is a, like a turning from one line to another as a plow person does. I kind of like the image actually quite a lot. Rows of poetic verse on the page like it's a plowed field. As long as it's not clear cut, hopefully you can still smell earth there. The connotation of turning earth in a field into a series of parallel furrows on settled land whose diverse indigenous ecosystem has been overwritten, however, requires questioning. Plow for me also conjures the snow plow after a blizzard that transfers smaller portions of a huge excess load by load to remove an obstacle and allow for some kind of flow. It's a mechanics of transfer of patience and of determination. This has been my writing life and my maternal life simultaneously. Open field poetics appealed to me originally and still because of the inclusiveness and diversity of form, allowing words, phrases, and clusters of text to be installed at many points across a page spread, instead of lining them up and gluing them to the left margin, incorporating different kinds of text, lyric fragments, found excerpts from different sources, including drawn figures and writing by hand and treating the page as place, score, map, terrain, writing as being with, assemblage, installation. Words are portals for other words and the simple trope of a portal as both entrance and exit proposes a spatial place-based idea about moving our bodies through the virtual architecture and landscapes configured by words. Words inhabit other words, word is inside world and worried. Words close together, for example, a word like toward is close to a word like war. Words also close together, words, chords, herds, records, all close with the same consonant blend. And words open together, wonder, wolf, wow. As I Google search plow and flow, so many shared contexts instantly come up. Airway pressure release ventilation studies, so important to respiratory care, especially in COVID. Iraqi farmers forced by drought to leave land as dams dry up. There's a photo of a man plowing a completely desiccated field. Water flow resistance to subsurface drainage canals in paddy fields. Berserk never before seen polar airflow weather patterns. Full torso yoga moves and creative sex aids, etc. Dead zones and hypoxia in lakes and oceans. What to do about brain blood flow blockage in fetal sheep. 
better downslope plowing patterns to retain water flow in hilly soil, how vowel sounds are produced by the human mouth without airflow being obstructed by the teeth, tongue, or lips, and of course, legions of links about snow removal. Here's a quick aggregate of fragments about snow plows. Listen to the concrete imagery and juicy diction. As we plow from curb to curb produced by constricting airflow, at slow speeds, snow is pushed or plowed, flowing through a narrow turbulence. Use the plow as a dozer to doze it down, flow a thin jet, alveolar, the tongue like a plow blade at the mold board ridge. All blue rivers flow, all low temp hydraulic, plow fluid is thrown, snowbank mounds provide for safe vehicular flow from one line to another as the plow driver snoozes. None of this is a poem now or yet, but the diverse context of these words and the multiple narrative geographies that become activated through encountering concrete imagery of materials, objects, spaces, and places start moving in tandem. Two words have exponentially multiplied in many directions. At the very least, these two words, flow and plow, are for the moment instant portals to looming contexts of climate insecurity and eco-crisis in every direction, although I suspect we'd get there through just about any prompt words now. Repetition with a difference has energy. I like to write, letting my listening lead. It puts me in an improvisatory space where everything might slide. Ears like a tabletop at an angle, every syllable, every word, sibilant, subject to shift. Call it semantic drift. Words are chewable, audible, changeable, malleable. You don't already know where your composition is headed. You travel inside it. This is the writing I like. I want it on my tongue. This is writing that frustrates many. Too shapeless, too multi-directional, too propositional, not positiony enough. I think of it as a practice of ongoing listening in time, holding, borrowing, furrowing, allowing one word to plow open a space for others to flow into, gradually building language out of an otherwise condition for me, and here this is no joke, of inaudibility and memorylessness. Sometimes this brings to my mind a poem by Emily Dickinson, After Great Pain, A Formal Feeling Comes, a poem that fascinates me because it gives me language for a feeling I had from a young age but couldn't name, a sensation of blankness. I don't usually quote Emily Dickinson, just so you know. But here it is. After great pain, a formal feeling comes. The nerves sit ceremonious like tombs. The stiff heart questions, was it he that bore? And yesterday or centuries before? The feet, mechanical, go round. A wooden way of ground or air or aught. Regardless grown, a quartz contentment like a stone. This is the hour of lead remembered if outlived as freezing persons recollect the snow, first chill, then stupor, then the letting go. Dickinson built a poem that uses numerous words with the vowel O. There's the O phoneme, formal, bore, or, before, go, groan, stone, snow, go. In close proximity, words with the ow phoneme, round, ground, grown, hour, and out. The poem connects the hard, solid matter of tombs, quartz, stone, and deadly snow as metaphors of the formal feeling of being close to freezing to death in a stupor, but of not dying instead of outliving death as a kind of memory of having almost touched the letting go that the poem suggests happens at or as death. There's something here about death as a relief, a release, a slipping up or away from the body. My whole childhood, I was told not to fall asleep on the snow. I take some time here to think about death by freezing. 
and the children who escaped residential schools only to die from exposure, as well as people barely surviving the pandemic sleeping in parks only to be assaulted and criminalized by cops. One phrase that really gets me is the hour of lead. The hour of lead. The formal feeling that thickens pain to stupor, to dissociating, to feeling as it were, nothing and everything at once. This hour of lead makes me think of a kind of cultural blankness, which is also the numbness, the erasure, the solipsism of whiteness and settlerhood often equitable with an uprooting, a resettlement, a transplantation, that first settler generation's cataclysmic life change, historical forgetting, an obliterating of the perceived other, a movement into the hour of lead, where nothing moves and there is no language, all is fixed, stoppered. For me, often wordless, unworlded, Then, if I listen, if I take the time to turn to my body, in comes that sense of biomorphic movement, awareness that words are amoebic, slippery, jiggling against each other. Some rhyme or echo, some oral tether unties words and allows their flow. Words arise from me, from the space I am surrounded by, from language itself, into a condition of before closure. My voice becomes a place. I can then be politically useful. I can write, feel, connect, acknowledge how to participate in public activism. One word leaning toward another word is a relationship of acknowledgement, acknowledgement of proximity, of likeness, and of difference, of separateness. Etymology and context are available. We can look up the words in Meredith's Oxford and theorize how they evolve from words in other languages across cultures and historical frames. Semantic drift and slide is about change, transit, calibrations of hybridity, intermixture, overlay, and possibilities for new iterations. It invites thought processes of composition to open the oral flow from word to word, from language to language all that crosstalk. Now I want to read a very short poem from B.P. Nickel from his early works written in 1965-66 called Before Closure. I'm always touched by how young he is here in his early 20s. Before Closure, a closet closes. A close loss seen becomes a loss enacted. All loss seems active, closest to the heart. Closure means a loss of becoming, becomes a closet in ourselves, closing. The poem is negotiating a kind of double entendre of the abstractions of loss and becoming made material through the image of the closet, a place which can close and keep things shut inside of it or close and create a space for moving on outside of those parentheses around the heart. But at what cost? And perhaps before any of this comes to pass, that is before closure, it is simply the close loss, the near miss of it, that creates a space to understand the risk of growth. The whole thing has that brain twister quality of Nichols entire poetics, which invites close attention and simultaneous reading and listening. I find it a little haunting that this poem echoes the precarious situation in Dickinson's poem of outliving a close loss and therefore even being able to remember to keep open a portal of past and future. Plows, flows, clothes, clothes, loss, closet, closest, closing, becoming. There's something so movemental about the way Nichols circuit of O vowel figures turn and turn on each other. It makes me recall this poem by Erin Moray from her 1988 book, Furious, where a similar metonymy of embodied figures entwine and revolve as if tumbling in a shared space. Rolling motion. 
your face in my neck and arms dwelling upward, face in my soft leg open, lifted upward, airborne soft, face into under, into rolling over every upward motion, rolling open over your face in my neck again, over turning risen touch billows, my mouth open, enter, dwelling upward face in your soft leg open, lifted upward, airborne soft, face into under into motion over every upward open, rolling open over your face in my neck again, and arms. This poem has the energy of cycles of engagement between lesbian lovers by focusing on the strings of a kind of must up placeless prepositions, and also by creating a sonic circuit of O words, your soft open airborne into rolling over motion touch billows mouth. There's also the two selves, your and my addressing each other, two bodies dwelling in an amplitude of touch, the words circulate as if time is flowing in multiple directions, forward, upward, under, into, rolling, open. If there is closure, it is mere rest before resumption. Sumptuous. I'm going to offer one more short poem by a poet whose work influences me, and that is the remarkable Dennis Lee. This is a poem called Slip Away from Lee's book, UN, or also UN, United Nations, UN. Slip away. Of the metrophysics of ice, slip away, seaboard. In Greenland, a glacial divide and last call for literal cities. Slip away, Sydney, London, Manhattan, Mumbai, Nostril meniscus, then chow. Or dikage and stiltage and humanoid critters vying with dogfish for all sorts. Slip, slip away, Athens, Rangoon, subaqueous fables of was, Rio, Vancouver, Shanghai. Slip, slip away, Buenos Aires. Cumulus rising. History slop in the wash. As if applying weight upon individual words to make them squish into other words, Lee creates portmanteau, words sliding together to create a word with multiple mixed connotations. This poem invents new words to enact entities overflowing, compressing and mutating. Metrophysics collapses metaphysics and metropolis. Cumulus intermeshes cloud and devastation, much like the atmospheric rivers plowing over BC and you. Flow has risen to overflow, irreversible, tragic, elegiac. There's some kind of invitation though here in naming the catastrophe to try to confront the future, to begin instead of to end. I didn't intend this talk to fit so roundly into the field of eco-poetics, but just those two words, flow and plow, make both water and earth under both human stewardship and human exploitation so very hyper-present. Lee engineers new language to meet the reality unfolding, which is one thing poets can do, must do, to move beyond closure. For whatever reason, I decided to focus on composition for this talk, to work with assonant and consonant pattern as a way to go from blankness to flow in poetry. In a way, maybe my return to writing by hand and sketchbook drawing this year are also keys to composition. You can find some of this daily work on my Instagram if you want. In fact, my earliest poetry was written on vehicles in the dark, buses and trains, sometimes planes. I was conjuring plenitude from scarcity, voice from silence, place from void. 
Composition by listening to the oral flow of one word to another allows you to be connective and continuous instead of bottoming out to blankness, hopelessness. I have to say it's been a very long time since I got to talk as a poet about writing. Like hundreds of poets across the country and some of them are on this Zoom together. All across the country, the practice and sociality of writing have been totally shut down. I have to say the music of language has helped and does help. So that's kind of the bulk of the talk. Now I'm gonna ask Alan to play for us a short video of mine. Sometimes I make really DIY, you know, kind of video experiments um, using my cell phone and my monitor and um, just the, the utilities at hand. So this is a short video in three voices. Uh, a meditation piece called The Heart Breaks and Then Breathes. So it's about two and a half minutes long um, and sort of have a bit of a break and also to give you a chance to sort of go internal in your own thought process. While this is playing, I invite you to listen for words, assonant and consonant words that arise in your own ear because they seem called up by sonic echo as you listen to this repeating meditation. So if you have, um, you don't even need a pen because what I'm asking you to do, if you would, if you want to participate is to listen. And as you're listening to put into the chat words that you're hearing in a kind of relationality with, with the words in this piece, okay? So just put them in the chat and we'll see where we get with that. Um, here we go. breaks and breathes, breaks and then breathes, the heart breaks and breathes, the earth hears and breaks, breaks and breathes, hears and then breaks and then breathes, the earth hears the heart, how the earth's heart breathes, the heart, the heart breaks, breaks and, and breathes. breathes, breaks, breaks and, and then breathes, breathes. The, heart the heart breaks and breathes. And breathes. The earth, the earth hears, hears and, breaks, and breaks, breaks, breaks and, breaks, and breathes. The earth hears and then breaks, hears, and then and breathes, breathes, and then breathes. The earth hears the, earth the heart, hears the heart, how the earth, how the heart, heart breathes. Heart the heart breaks and breathes. The heart breaks and breaks, breaks and then breathes. The earth hears the heart, the heart breaks, and hears and then breathes. The earth hears and breaks, the earth hears the heart and breathes. How the earth hears and then breaks, hears and then breathes, and then breathes. The earth hears the heart, the earth hears the heart, the earth's heart, the earth's heart, the heart heart breaks, the heart breaks, the heart breaks, and breaks, the earth and breathes, the earth hears, and the heart breaks, and breathes, and then breathes, and then breathes, the earth hears, and breaks. The earth hears the heart breaks meditation breathes. How the earth the heart breathes. The heart breaks and then breathes and then breathes. Break heart hears the breathe. The earth hears the heart breaks. How the earth the heart breathes. Heart the earth hears and the heart breaks and breaks. The earth hears and the heart hears and then breathes. Hears and then breathes and then breathes. The earth hears the heart hears the heart meditation. How the earth's heart the earth's heart breathes. The heart breaks breaks and breathes and then breathes. The heart breaks and breathes. Breaks and then breathes. The heart breaks and breathes. The earth breathes and breaks. The earth hears, breaks and breathes. The earth hears the heart. The earth hears the heart. The heart breaks. The heart breaks. The heart breaks and breathes. Breaks and then breathes. The heart breaks and breathes. The earth hears and breaks. Breaks and then breathes. Hears and then breaks and then breathes. The earth hears the heart. How the earth's heart breathes. The heart breaks and breathes. Breaks and then breathes. The heart breaks and breathes. The earth hears and breaks. Breaks and breathes the earth. Hears and then breaks and then breathes.
Thank you, Ellen. So what I'd like to do now is um, I'd like to ask you to unmute yourself. And for those who have put a bit of text in the chat, I'd like you simply to read your piece if it comes in the sequence, okay? So that we'll just have this very small, very incidental collective poem that gathers these pieces of language that have been generated by another text, okay? So because we're unmuting, I just would ask you as well to be aware of other space in your, in your surrounding. If, if it's too loud in your place, just you can mute yourself again. Um, so that's my invitation. I think uh, I think we could start with Kate. And what we'll do is we'll just rely on all of our capacity to follow along the chat and just hear these small pieces out loud together. Breathless. Tears. Break breathless hurts earth ears breeze baby and a heartbeat hear the heart the heart hears heartbeat the art hears Breeds the earth. Aches and ease. Wakes. Thank you. With my online teaching over the last, well, through the pandemic, I found more and more that um, doing collective poetry works really well on Zoom. And I have another thing I'd like to do together, but I'll see if we have time a little bit later, okay? So I'm gonna go back to um, the text and um, what I thought I'd do is uh, share a little bit of uh, my published work uh, and a couple of things I'm working on. Um, it's very strange. Multitudes totally disappeared. I have one copy in my apartment. It totally disappeared. And it's a bit trickster, strange. So tonight what I'm going to do is, um, share, first of all, just a small piece from uh, my recent book, which is called uh, Dear Birch. It's from Palimpsest. The book is a poem cycle that uh, was composed over a nine day period in August of 2018. And uh, it was composed as I sat in relation to a particular birch tree and wrote. So there was a lot of very active environmental listening uh, and very situated listening that produced a kind of effective, you know, site for this, this text to emerge. Being in a mode of deep listening permeates the book and most of the book is made up of quite long narrative poems. It's very narrative. So I'm just gonna read one small piece um, that sort of sits alone. And in this piece, uh, the third person narrator is addressing the tree. So I'll just give you a taste taste of it. August 19th. Then, as a long and slow second thought, she properly takes you in. Your zinging cicada trill, your outfurled flags of foliage, the neighbor babies' large grunts like garden toads, palpable through their shared fence. In the kitchen behind her, her own twins are in their home shorts, swilling warm salt water across the healing sockets where their wisdom teeth were tugged out three days ago. Houseflies and moths flit in her periphery. Your special vitamin is a quiet patience for reading. You line yourself up to enter her radiant syrup, 
supplemental toxin. She is becoming intoxicated. I was one of the lucky people to have two books come out during the pandemic. The other was this book called Charger from uh, Talon Books. And this book is made of uh, deeply spatialized text. I'm not sure how well you can see it. Um, the entire book is written across the gutter. And the pieces of language are distributed across the field, not in a way that really engages with um, this sort of diverse, multiplicit, uh, form, formal um, invention that often goes with the long poem. It was more uh, an exploration of what would happen. Could, could, could a reader, would a reader want to stay with the act of reading, which in this case simply means connecting one word to another across that gutter in a, in a non-normative way. So, would a reader engage with this kind of act of rebellion <laughs> um, and find the poem or would they not? And um, that's been quite interesting because a lot, of, a lot of people actually haven't found the poems in this book or have found something that they cannot understand as narrative. So I'm gonna read one, one poem from Charger. Um, There's also actually a short video of this poem on YouTube if you wanted to check it out, but um, I wanted to try reading it for you. This poem uses a lot of semantic drift in establishing the, the kind of movement of, of voice um, through the piece. So you'll hear these sonic progressions from word to word and a meditation on how social media has become a kind of toxin that holds us in its thrall alongside the lives we're also trying to live in person, in place. And I like this poem in terms of um, young uh, university students because I'm kind, of, um, I'm kind of referring and thinking about young people um, moving from their summer jobs back into a sort of classroom uh, context in this poem. So it's, it seems kind of situated in an interesting way. Charger 12. It's like a solar powered lawnmower arrives to do his duty. Both the guy and the machine operate their powers to puncture what we refer to as nature's score of laps and licks and skirmishes of breeze and Christ, but isn't it agitational? I just wanted a little quiet. Now three of them actually out of a van off a trailer and coordinated chorus of mowers moving over the short green expanses, making them shorter and less green, more uniform, more ground down to echo the contours of the ground itself. And I know it's their summer job and they're likely students at the college with two weeks final pay before fall classes begin and at the very least, they're footing their own smartphone bills, so instant texting, liking, and swiping will continue when their palms are ready to charge again, primed to guzzle upon the shared, social, all-we-can-eat. And what's so special or natural about quiet, anyhow? Take this wind-scuttled, open-concept place and set it in some walls, it's all sound, never stillness. If we pay attention to John Cage, if we hear beyond the measure, everybody in the room gets to choose an interval that is bearable. Our hands twitch, our arms fold inward. Our brain quickens for something more intense or less streamlined, like a cow with four stomachs. We're restless for all the chambers to be filled in with the white juice we both milk and make, drink and emit. It's a choice pre-millennial generations took for all of us and urge our bodies bristle to bear. So I get when I'm teaching why at break, all my students stay in their seats, wordless and feeding on the slick streams of digital updates, 
while I sneak a quick look for a red flare alit on the text message icon because later I want to gorge on your French kisses and the suspense is killing me softly with its song-like unisonic pantomime. A set of echoes, all the bodies in this chamber can't help but quaver together like a dun green field of cows lowing at sundown, moaning for farmers to load the feed at chest level for us. We who are being so disciplined about the interval Gertrude Stein told us was how a sentence actually happens, how a thing knows itself to be filled in enough to be as discernible as a stomach of its own alongside the multiple other stomachs waiting obediently for the brain spill to arrive, the infill to burst a plenty into radiant data bins we love to believe will be obviously refilled, how they'll be full again of futurity's poetry, of the news, all the new news, smooth chewed by three solar powered mowing machines now corded up on their iron trailer, drenched in some later descendant sun. A caravan led by one young tanned hand smuggling a cell phone below the rear view mirror while his second black's hand steers past a lowing herd loose on a field near the emptying college toward a neon dusk brightened all beef burger drive through with Ms. Lauren Hill on the van radio like it's still the 20th century. So now I'll just make a few words about two of my current projects and read you one or two more poems. So first of all, um, one of the projects I'm working on is called Evenness, Unevenness, Evanescences. It's a deeply constrained poetry project using only words that have no ascenders or descenders. So it becomes very architectural. It's reliant on those streamlined lines of verse that run parallel and never touch, that are foremost bent on a protocol of sameness, like those straight rows of the plow on a piece of land. Control and sticking to a plan are foremost until the last section, which is called Evanescences, where the manuscript uses the same constraint but moves to extravagance with it. So that's kind of what I wanted to read to you tonight. Um, Actually, I'm going to read you one that reflects the scan section. There's a section called scansion, where the poems, each poem is built. It's, a, it's found from a, a, a newspaper article where I do a sort of a retrieval procedure, harvesting all of the, the language in the poem, in the, in the article rather, that uh, fits the constraint. And um, I'll just let you hear one of them. This one is called Scan X. NASA on Mars, Sirius rover a summer on Mars areas, uncover river. Recur as Mars curious near science, now some measure is science new on mission. Was NASA on Mars in US sciences worse? More measures one rover on is a mission. Russian is rover is sure, so measures camera on rover. This piece is called Minnows in Ammonia. We are civic musicians in a war zone cinema. Our noise is eerie, our arias, no nonsense. Crows answer, concuss us. Commissionaires microwave marinara sauce on rice. Marrow is wine. Wine is marrow or someone in sorrow one in seven use conscience as a mini series on win-win economics. Assassins survive as screensavers. 
Nurses wean anemic moaners, so cream accrues in camera. Come varicose warriors, mama woos a severe romance in venom. A zoo, oxen in wax museums, sere cresses ooze. We miscue an ominous occasion, a zero sum casino. Even our overview is murmurous erasure, minnows in ammonia, warmer monsoons. Moraine coronaries in a raw VCR newsroom. One sonar mess our seismic wearinesses or worse, cosmic cremains in rear view mirror neon. Is eco-awareness some crossover monomania? Arnica on an oversworn scar? Xerox servicer on Novocaine? Or can voices exercise in non-acrimonious manner some nirvana cure on air? Rivers, a circus maneuver unwoven, unisonic. Wire me a so-so coin mosaic. Mazes ease cows in minimum nausea. Reason swerves. We maw over our same warm viscera. Unsureness crisscrosses, serene. And the second piece is uh, kind of an aria for women over 50 becoming uh, raucous. It's sort of inviting the crone collective. Um, arioso. We swarm in a microcaucus erasure, a canoe museum con amore, a cor corvine sarcoma in concession eons. We swim as oceanarian coxswains in semi-conscious overexercise. Our sinuses accessorize novice moon missions. We are encore, non-serious, innumerous, non-zero minxes. We use an increase in ivories as ironies in common sense cosery. We MC murmurous Oscar ceremonies in no man size mauve crowns. Our amorous amnions come across as nevermore menses, no mums or mamas or mamas can vex since our cervical vivaria are as cancerous as Venus as Isis, as Aurora, as Eo, as Cirque, as Amazonian earworms, cocoon unnervous musicians, mezza voce in remission. We are vice versa reservoirs, raucous crones in non-secure career income ruins or racimos carnivora on sea onion ramen. We caress no-no successors, so-so movers over en masse in rainwear on uneven revenue avenues. We ransom craven omissions, we are morse mice in an ozone camora carcass. We mew, we senesce, we seize. So the last thing I was gonna share was um, just a, a quick look at um, some of the visual poems and concrete poems I've been making that are part of, the part of an extended project called um, Instant Mind just now. Um, with, with this digital social media project, I'm using serial poetics to create digital photo text collages that conjure continuous embodied time and presence against instantaneous obsolescences mandated by social media and late capitalism. That's a mouthful, but that's what I'm doing. Social media composition is entirely grounded in address on audience reception and need of the other. The underlying anxiety is that no one will hear you, that one's voice will disappear and sink into the pan auditron. Whereas composition by sonic pull, essentially a lyric musical practice puts us in our senses in the flow of time, which is I think what I was drawn to try to speak about earlier tonight. So much of this project called Instant Mind is performed directly on my Facebook account. Um, and it's been going for about six years now. I'm still figuring out how to transfer the project into physical space. And during this residency, I think I'll make a lot of headway. For now, I'm just wanting to share a few images from the concrete poems presented on my website. Uh, images that are created mostly, again, by these very sort of um, simple, naive processes of using uh, laptop, monitor, cell phone, sort of reposts and circuits, creating a kind of eerie, highly tech technologized uh, kind of poem image. Um, so Alan, I think, are you able to share that? Thank you so much. 
And I'm hoping that I can, can I move things? Not sure. Unfortunately not, I'll have to move it. For can you. you just very slowly move down a little bit and we'll stop at, at one. Um, so as people can see there, there's this very strong blue light cast on all of the imagery. Um, many of them, uh, you know, sort of start as a social media post that I make and then I baffle or take away. Um, if you go down a little bit more, I'm just wanting to, there are poems like this one, which use a lot of um, letter recombination. Uh, so this, this uh, handheld device is the text that finally emerges as we go through a vowel. Uh, procedure where the vowel simply moves through through its normal progression e i o u y a. You can follow the vowel streams down the little texts, and you arrive sort of like as a surprise at the text. So if you can stop here, Alan, thank you so much. I just want to look at the one over here on the left of the screen, which um, is a vowel recombination procedure. O tuyuch oi. Utiak ia e teich ae a teich oi e tiok ui I touch you. And I play a lot with that kind of attention procedure with small pieces of text as a kind of daily um, practice that ends up on my social media. Um, and if you could just scroll down the rest of the way, I think that's all the comments I want to make um, on this material. Now it's actually, there's a big thesis behind it and I think I'm too tired to, <laughs> to actually tell you more about it for now. But um, it is all there online and uh, it's been really interesting actually to think about the concrete visual poem in a, in a digital space. That's just one sort of aspect of, of the project that uh, I'm calling Instant Mind. So thank you very much. Thanks, Alan, that's great. Um, thank you everyone for uh, holding my voice in, in uh, place together. I really appreciate it. And um, I'd love to hear uh, some conversation. Um, I think also you can, um, you can unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question with your voice. Um, I think, I guess I'm supposed to, um, yes, I can confirm that Margaret to, to everybody. If okay. you're, if you're comfortable from the audience, um, just pitching in, in your own voice, please, please do that when there's a, uh, there's a gap in the conversation. Otherwise, okay. uh, type into the chat and Margaret can pick things out of there. Thank you, Margaret, thanks. And let me just say off the top, while um, people are typing or pondering, that if I heard you write that expression of yours, putting us in our senses, in the flow of time, <laughs> sounds very alluring. To be put, to be put back, to be put again, to be put further into our senses, mm. flow of time um, beneath these atmospheric rivers or whatever other, environments we may find ourselves in, medial uh, and planetary, seems like a, a very fitting ambition for, for a Meredith and Peter Quatermain poet at this moment. I hope it seems that way to Meredith and Peter too. Uh, mm -hmm. But thank you for that. And well, other phrases though, the word phrase seems really pathetically inadequate to the kinds of combinations that we've been enjoying. So I'll pause now and see what okay. anyone else would like to interpolate. I have a question. Um, do you hear me? Kyla? Yeah. Great. Hi. I, I don't know. Okay. Here you go. Okay. Um, I really enjoyed your poem on social media. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I was wondering whether... Um, you um, had allowed your students to also write some type of poem with regards to their social media usage. Um, 
Not so much because the kinds of procedures we were doing were like emerged out of um, Zoom situations like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we ended up using the, you know, the forms that are available to us on the Zoom. Um, but I do actually create, you know, and, and it, if you want, we could do another, we could do another activity. Um, I do try to provide the possibility for people on a Zoom to also get up and use their body and um, experience sort of coming back to the site of the Zoom as, a, as an actual place. We, we sort of forget mm. that it is a place and that they're mm -hmm. surrounded by other places and we're surrounded by language and material and image and, um, and a, you know, an acoustic environment um, that we can lose, lose track of. So that's more what I've done, uh, I've experimented with in my Zoom teaching. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Remembering that we're still here virtually. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing. Sure. Thanks for the comment. Anyone else? Margaret, uh, I, a question about your instant mind project, uh, which I, I love what you're doing there. It's so, but I wondered whether whether you thought, or perhaps you've done this, um, uh, of making uh, making the like individual frames dynamic, like making it video as well as as well as text. And and how like what do you think of that? What what would you how would you think that? Yeah, I've done I've done actually quite a bit of video that ends up um, ends up. Mm, moving into public space, uh, you know, through, through Facebook. Um, but I, I really didn't, I didn't really, um, I really didn't discuss Instant Mind. Instant Mind is mostly a, it's a, it's a interdisciplinary project where I'm thinking about time in the, uh, in the current moment where all of our technology is hurtling us into obsolescence ourselves as a as a, a species as a planet uh, where where the goal is uh, instant forgetting instant new right I mean we've been in capitalism for a long time but paired with the technology that we're uh, forever being goaded to replace an update um, also the, the the entire kind of concept behind um, our our you know, sort of inhabitation of time is that time is, is draining away, that we don't have time, that it's just in time. And that um, the just now instantly becomes, you know, obsolescent. And so some of what I'm trying to do with um, serial works where I, I take a text or I deal with a text with uh, sh shooting it um, on a laptop and threading it back through my cell phone and onto my monitor. And then, you know, I think Ralph, you've actually seen quite a lot of the work where I then go in and make graphic sort of incursions on the image, but there's a lot about the time stamping, this sort of um, creating a text that, that I myself, um, you know, refigure and kind of keeping, keeping this, this log of how the how the text how the image shifts and changes with the timestamp system that um, is meant to is meant to make make us excited about you know speeding up. So I'm trying to reverse it and be recursive with the way the timestamp structures work. Moving images, I'm not as interested in so far, but um, I'm also really, really interested in adding sound and vocal, mm -hmm. vocal stuff into the instant mind work. I'm so excited to have the time um, in the residency yeah. to, to pursue a lot of the elements. Um, but instant mind is, is actually, you know, I, I'm probably giving it short shrift, not, not really talking about it very much, but um, uh, the goal is to create a kind of uh, to create a kind of 
uh, effective space in which the still now or the elongated now or the, uh, the re reaccessed now is available to us also through our technology instead of it you know being being erasive. Um, we do have some great examples of it, but thanks for the question. <laughs> Did anyone, I think I have a message from Peter. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. And we are going to have more time with Margaret. Um, and, and we can elongate it just as we like, but there's no need uh, for us to keep her very much longer this evening. It is getting late in Toronto. And I happen to know that M Margaret has been busy working on this residency late into the night on other occasions recently, because I've watched some of the uh, conversations she's been having with our resident members already setting up uh, projects and activities around the precincts of the college. So um, speaking now strictly as principal of Green College, I would like us to be somewhat economical with our writer in residence. So if there is no one else wanting to burst in on the conversation now, let's take the rest of our time respectively, each of us this evening to, to let some of these words sink in. Thank Margaret, as I do now on behalf of everybody here, um, for doing a reading without, without reading once from the book that she had meant to read <laughs> from. Um, that's the kind of extempore performance we expect from our, uh, our writers here. Um, we do have, I think the reason you don't have any copies of Multitudes, um, Margaret, is because we have a, a box of them here so that there will be plenty to go around uh, yeah. the college. And there will be, I dare say, enough for, for visitors too, if you get here quickly, um, non-residents ne next term. Uh, in any case, we'll have, we'll have more of multitudes and we'll have more of the multitude of Margaret Christakos soon and some of the company that she's going to bring into the college to, to join us, because that's another facet uh, of, of the residency. So for now, for this moment, Thank you all for coming. Do come again. Keep an eye on the Green College website as uh, we finalize the program for Margaret's in-person events next term. But be reassured that the public part of that program will almost all, I think, if not entirely, be hybrid. So there'll be a live stream and there'll be videos on our YouTube channel after the events. Uh, but if you do live locally and conditions allow, come on over. There'll be receptions after the events and plenty of opportunities for us to touch voices almost physically. Well, actually physically, voice being a very material and physical thing and for us to look each other directly in the eye without any screens interposed. Lots hey. of greetings and thanks on the screen. You, you may have, of course, the last word or as many words, Margaret, as you'd like. Oh. Well, thanks so much, everyone. I, uh, I appreciate uh, you all being here. I know everyone has uh, many, many, many things pulling at your time, and uh, I'm quite overjoyed to see uh, many of you here. So thanks so much, and um, stay safe. Um, let's hope the weather settles down. And um, for all of us who are writers, um, you know, I love that you're writing. Keep writing. Um, it's so hard. Uh, this has been just an extraordinarily hard time. Um, and we need to get, we need to find ways to, to be with each other this year. Um, and I guess books are the best ways to do that. But um, I really miss, uh, you know, sort of uh, collaborating and, um, and inventing together. So uh, collectively, I hope to have the time to also, uh, you know, sort of conjure some of that over, over the, the cold long winter. Okay, thanks a lot. Have a great night.